This Week in Startups is brought to you by Citrix GoToMeeting. Meeting is believing. Visit gotomeeting.com. Click the Try It Free button and sign up for a 30-day trial. And DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is the fastest-growing cloud infrastructure provider built for developers. With state-of-the-art data centers around the world, DigitalOcean is laser-focused on its mission to simplify infrastructure for development teams. DigitalOcean is laser-focused on its mission to simplify infrastructure for development teams. Visit digitalocean.com slash twist and get $10 credit to spin up a server in 55 seconds. Hey, everybody. Today on the show, Roger Dickey, the founder of Gigster, which is a company that Mark Andreessen and myself recently funded. What are they trying to do? They're trying to disrupt the world of software development by letting you get a price for any software project online right now at gigster.com. It's a really revolutionary company in how they approach software development. And if it works... I think it could be a unicorn. Roger is a fantastic guest. He's got a lot of great insights, and you're going to learn a lot about product development and software and outsourcing and why he believes controversially that software development at startups is best done outside of the startup. It's a fascinating discussion and a great company. Stick with us. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. Hey everybody, welcome to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, and this is the show where we talk about entrepreneurship, angel investing, and trying to change the world one product at a time. My guest today is Roger Dickey. He is with a company called Gigster, which I found out about because they sponsored one of our events, and I got to know the founder, and I said, wow, this is a great business idea. And sure enough, I just invested in the company. I don't know if I'm allowed to say how much I put into the company. Is it? That, no. <laughs> I shouldn't say? All secrets. All secrets? All right. I put a little bit in, a couple of high societies. Let's leave it at that for the poker <laughs> people watching. And uh, I am in love with this company because one of the things that's incredibly hard today is that we are uh, living in a world where there aren't enough developers, there aren't enough resources to build all the great ideas that people have. And people are now in a dogfight to get talent to the point at which the tenure of developers at startup companies is being measured in months, not years. Quite literally, people are staying nine months, 12 months, 15 months at a company. All the good stuff tends to happen in year three or four. What that's led to is a lot of the startups I work with are outsourcing or hiring teams in other countries, right, and having a, an outpost somewhere else. Well, Roger's got a really good idea and some very strong feelings about how development work is specifically done. Some people are pissed off about Roger's views on this. Others are inspired. I fall into the later camp, which is why... I did which what is the greatest uh, vote of confidence any angel investor can do, which is writing a check. I heard the ideas. I said, hey, can I put some money in? Uh, and then also, we have a big announcement just today. That's right, today. Huge announcement. And this is Roger, by the way. Welcome to the program, number one. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, what's the big announcement today? Uh, so we just announced our Series A today. We raised $10 million from, uh, of course, yourself. Andreessen, uh, Y Combinator invested their pro rata, a um, couple other great investors such as Ashton Kutcher, uh, the owner of the Sacramento Kings, SV Angel, Ron Conway got super excited about it. Um, really great syndicate. We're super happy. Yeah, you got the best of the best in there. It's a pretty great group. Um, 10 million bucks for an A round. Yeah. Kind of unheard of these days. You came in with a very strong pitch, I guess, and some strong numbers. Yep. Uh, why don't you show us um, how the product works and why you built it? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll just dive into a quick demo. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to visit the website here. Okay, here we go, Gigster. And, uh, you know, this is the main page, so I can go through. I can learn a bit more about the product. Great, hire an elite development team in minutes. That sounds wonderful. Um, you know, Gigster has amazing talent, a uh, couple of case studies, that sort of thing. Uh, so let's say I decide I'm convinced. Go back to the top, and I start a new project. 
So this is going to load me into the uh, into the new project system. Uh, right off the bat, we we let you sign an NDA if you'd like. So as you can see, this button is skip by default. Uh, mm. We have a lot of uh, bigger customers these days, enterprise customers that have their own NDAs they'd like us to use, or uh, you know they don't want to be bound by this till they chat with their legal department. This they is to protect wanna... the customer, it's the just person the customer. with the project. Yeah, so yes. that I'm going to give you my idea exactly for the right. for the next Uber. I don't want you stealing it. Exactly right. I'm or not, the developers yeah. who are in your network. Yeah, well, they, they can't steal it either. They, yeah. they sign NDAs with us, we sign an NDA with the customer, and it's all bi-directional and everything. Um, Fantastic. The lawyers, the lawyers made it all work. So yeah, I, I don't even think this is mutual honesty. I think it's just there to protect the customer, like you said. So yeah. I'm going to go ahead and sign it, because why not? Why not? Uh, nothing to hide. Um, so let's 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 pick a silly idea today. So pizza is a huge market. It's actually a $50 billion market. So let's build, let's build an Uber for pizza. Uh, you know, it's funny you mentioned that. I've had this idea. And I really? met a guy who's making something in this area that's going to allow... The, basically, the idea is, can you do a 15-minute pizza? Okay. Because, right, Domino's was like 30 to 45 minutes. Yep. The new idea is, hey, can you get it in 15 to 30 minutes, and that'll be revolutionary. Is his name Evan, by any chance? I can't say. Okay. I, can't say. <laughs> I think a lot of people are on the pizza tip right now. Okay. Some, I, I think this is a, a, an entrepreneurial thing today is to look at what people spend a large amount of money on uh -huh. and then say, how do I Uber it? So it's like toothpaste. Do you realize that of the <laughs> 320 million Americans, 295 million of them use toothpaste every day? It's like, the what others happened? are horrible. What's going on people? with the 25 million who aren't? <laughs> <laughs> but that's how people work backwards, though, to <laughs> yep. find a business idea. So pizza Top sounds like down. a good enough one. Here we go. Pizza. <laughs> I love it. We're going to make an Uber for pizza. Yes, let's do it. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'm going to choose a budget. Uh, let's say I pick, you know, 20 to 50 thousand. That, that sounds about right to make a, a seems an fair. app, right? Yep. Um, okay, so I'm going to choose, I'm going to try not to right click here, which huh. it's kind of doing for me. Okay. Uh, Maybe reload the page. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of getting confused. There we go. There. There okay. We go. Well, it's, uh, thinks I'm in control. Oh, I just well. don't know how to use a computer these days, apparently. Uh, okay. So, um, uh, when do you want it? When do you want to start? So this is a great signal for our sales team, right? If you want it now, then we're going to, we're going to kind of dive on it, pay maybe a little more attention. Otherwise, we'll you know give you some space and we'll we'll kind of work to get work to uh, to uh, gather requirements from you. So I'm going to say I want it uh, in a week. Let's say you and want to start in a week, not the finished product. I like yes, I like it to start in a week. Start exactly. In a week. Yeah. Exactly. When am I going to kick off the project? Yeah. So it used to be what you said. It used to be that uh, we asked you how long you wanted the cycle to go, but you know that we have to have that conversation first. So yeah. we we change it to this. It's a little better. Makes sense. So uh, you know I'm going to say I'm going to say I want this on iOS because that's where my target market is. I'm going to click sure. next to proceed. So just need to put in an email address. I'll call myself customer, you know, a couple numbers at gmail.com. Put in a uh, sample password. And uh, so I can choose to be contacted later or I can chat with a gigster now. If I choose contact me later, uh, it's going to go into our CRM system and I'll get an email generally within an hour from a sales engineer, which is great. Because, you know, maybe I'm in the middle of something. I don't want to do a chat. I'm at work uh, and I just want to send materials later. So, you know, some people choose that. Actually, most people choose chat with a gigster now, which is great. It's very validating to our sort of uh, immediate, real-time um, sales flow. So as you can see, I've loaded a screen here. So I've got, I've got a quick overview showing the information that I gave. Uh, I can see my project engineer is named John M. Um, so if I'd like, I could even click on the team and I could learn a little bit more about John. Um, so you know, I, I can get his email address here. Uh, if he'd put his LinkedIn into the system, then I'd have that. John's a freelancer, just like everyone else on our network. Our sales engineers are freelancers. Our developers, our designers, and our product managers, these are all freelancers. So they can put in whatever information they'd like. Um, so he's asked me for a bit of information. Can you describe your project in greater detail? Um, sure, I want an app where I push a button and get pizza. <laughs> push button for pizza. <laughs> exactly. How much would that cost? So let's see what John has to say about this. And this is occurring in real time. You didn't set this up. You didn't pick who was going to answer this. No. You just have a certain number of people on call ready to go at any point in time. That's absolutely right. Yeah. So right So right at this moment, we have about 15 people that are taking chats. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and so this has never been done before because if you want to build something, you typically would put out a Craigslist ad or even if you went on to like, I guess – the Elances or Upworks of the world would be the other competitors, maybe yep. in this space. You have to like be like, oh no, I don't want a writer in Manila or a right. <laughs> like they have a wide range of services available. I don't want somebody yes. to fill out catchpas for me. I'm looking for an actual developer, and then like, yeah, we have a developer in India or Sao Paulo, but these generally are not the top of the line developers. So, what developers do you have, and how do you get 
I, I know the answer to this, obviously. I'm an investor, but how do you get top flight developers into your system? And what's the, how do they, uh, why are they attracted to doing this kind of instant gratification work as opposed to going to work at Google? It's a great question. And it's, uh, it's a very common question. So my, my background is software engineering. I've been coding since a pretty young age. And uh, I, I still remember my first job after college. I, I worked. I was working about eighty hours a week on uh, on a compiler. Uh, this company in Austin, Texas. You know, I was getting a couple patents a year. I was doing some pretty hardcore engineering work that was taking up a lot of my time. But even on top of those eighty hours a week worth of you know like research and development hours, I had, I, I did about twenty or thirty hours a week worth of side projects because I just had this insatiable uh, thirst for learning. I had to be doing new things, right? I, I had this interest in computer graphics, but my job was in compilers. I sat working on backends all day. Mm. So I had to go home and I built, I built 3D gaming engines. I built ray tracers. I was really fascinated by Pixar. So I thought, you know, how, how do I make something that works the way Pixar's rendering engine does, right? So I would, I would, I would merge some of those hobbies with work at, some, you know, at times that I'd bring some cool demo to show my boss, but all of that was outside and your the boss would be like, dude, doing. Back to work on the compiler. Yeah, exactly. What Just are you doing? Work on the compiler. This isn't going to use your time. I'm going to get yelled at. <laughs> this is not Pixar. Yeah. So if I could have gone home and gotten paid for doing these side projects, like if somebody wanted me to build a ray tracer and I could go build that for them, that would be badass, right? Right. So that, that's what we find is when you, when, you, when you take the best knowledge workers in the world, you take the best developers, the best product managers, the best designers, they're always doing side projects. They always have some little thing that they, they do when they, when, when, when they you know, go home on the weekends, whatever. So we, we, we go around and we find those people. And they join Gigster. They're attracted to it because uh, because of the freedom. Um, oftentimes, they keep their job for a while. But uh, you know, later, oftentimes, we give them the confidence to quit, start their own company, and know that they can have an income stream um, after they leave. So uh, I, I could continue the demo if you'd like. It looks yeah. like so. What does he say? This guy's chatting with us. So he says, um, "Would you like iOS or Android?" Um, I'll say, "Let's do iOS." Um, so he's he, he's giving me a little estimate, and I'll say that price works. Oh, he gave you an estimate. Yeah, he said. So he said it'll cost. Uh, he said twenty thousand dollars in here. Um, so I'm going to ask him, how do I start? Um, kind of see see what he follows up with. Uh, so what what he's done now is um, you see this, the screen actually changes now. This blue bar across the top. I've got this payment button here. So uh, it looks like he says uh, he says we're ready to go. Take a look at the proposal. So I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. Um, so this little this screen shows up. Um, this is a proposal from Gigster. So um, th this example uh, is actually somewhat canned because we've done this demo a few times. But this 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 is a normal proposal. So proposals mm -hmm. uh, they, they typically take this form. They'll be they'll be about this length, uh, maybe maybe as much as twice or three times as long. Mm. But we don't go for really long proposals because we like to just detail the broad strokes. So if a customer comes to us and the, you know they say I, I want a web page, you know there should be a landing page. You sign it with Facebook. There's a feed with likes and comments. We know how to build that. We don't have to write a 20 page spec that says you know the like button will be here. What you know five pixels from the left. That, that that kind of brings too much too much rigidity to the process. We like to uh, we like to leave it open and give the customer flexibility later on. Mm. So we try to lock about eighty percent of it. We try to lock the broad strokes up front, and our pricing calculator prices are on the broad strokes. And after that, we know there'll be variability in what people want, so we leave that open ended. And we don't we don't deliver really long proposals because we don't win every project. So as a small startup, we have to stay efficient. Um, so initially, it was a forcing function based on our size and level of resources. And we realized down the road, hey, people actually like these short proposals. It's actually better business than to send a thirty page proposal, which you might get from an agency. So uh, you can now see this is very short. What about design, though? Now, so he's giving an idea of what it would take to build this. That's right. Obviously, it could be shorter. It could be longer, because um, the scope of work isn't super clear yet. That's right. But what I get the sense you're doing is you're planting a flag so that this discussion moves quicker. Is that am I getting that right? Yeah, and, and I can actually pay to start the project and that price is one hundred percent guaranteed. Ah. So not only are we planting a flag, but this is uh, we're we're ready to do business with you at this point as a customer. So we know you want to do some design. We don't know exactly what it looks like, but we've priced out what we call basic design. Mm. If you come in and you say, no, I'm going to be launching this, and I have a friend at TechCrunch, and I'm going to do a bunch of PR, then we'll say, OK, do you, know, do you have a little extra money? Do you want to spring for more advanced design? Mm. Right? And then we'll just know in advance, hey, we need to give you a better designer, more design hours, mm. more, more feedback cycles in the design, you know, uh, more time to wireframe, whatever it is. OK, when we get back from this important break, I want to ask you a very important question, which is, how do you ensure that people are happy uh, with their projects, and are people happy with their projects when you're giving a flat rate? And we all know that customers have scope creep. The scope creeps. 
And when we get back, I want to understand how Gigster deals with scope creep on This Week in Startup. Ah, uh, yes, Citrix go-to meeting. I love this product. They use it constantly. Think about all the time, money, and hassle it takes to hold a meeting. People have to go from the peninsula up to here, back and forth, the 101, the 280, the 405, the 10. It doesn't matter where you live. There's tons of traffic, parking, nonsense. Planes are late and expensive. My recommendation is that you meet your clients and coworkers online with Citrix GoToMeeting. It is the smarter way to meet. And in fact, I just did this with five entrepreneurs from around the planet. I was meeting with them on a GoToMeeting, talking about how to present their companies and how to raise venture capital. It's easy to meet with your team wherever you need to, wherever you are, because GoToMeeting, you can meet from a computer, a tablet, a smartphone, no travel expenses, no hassle. Your team joins by just clicking a link. There is no sign up. There's no speed bumps. You turn on your webcam and you have HD quality. It is stunning. I literally just had seven people show their HD video from around the globe, and it was perfect. And that's what you get when you use Citrix GoToMeeting. It's flawless. I love it. I've been using it for years. I probably do eh, between five and ten uh, go-to meetings a week, I would say, conservatively. And everyone um, gets to see what you're doing because you can switch the presenter. One person can present their product. Next person can do a keynote. Next person can use Reflector to show their iPhone app. It is incredible. I love it. Um, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to sign up for a go-to meeting today. Try it free for 30 days. There is nothing to lose. Just visit gotomeeting.com and click on the Try It Free button. Do it now, and you'll have your first meeting set up and running in minutes. That's gotomeeting.com for your free 30-day trial. And go ahead and thank at GoToMeeting on your Twitter handle. They love to see that our fans are loyal. Okay, let's get back to this great episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm Jason Calacanis, and my guest today, Roger Dickey of Gigster. Go ahead and follow Try Gigster on the Twitter and go to Gigster, G-I-G-S-T-E-R, online. And go ahead and right now fill out the form and explain your dream app that you want and get a price quote for your dream app. Because it is one of the things that's incredibly frustrating to people. They don't even know how much something costs. Uh, now, you don't charge hourly. That's and right. there is massive scope creep in every project. So take me through how you deal with the fact that it's not hourly and people are constantly adding and removing stuff and you know maybe they expected that you were going to, of course, support Facebook and Google Plus and Twitter login and that wasn't in the proposal. How do you deal with that when I say, what do you mean you can't log in with Facebook? Do you get a lot of that? And how do you deal with the scope creep? We get we get a little, you know, I I wouldn't say we get any more than uh, you know your typical development shop would. Um, it, it's it sort of comes with a business. You have some customers that are good at establishing requirements up front. Some customers that are really reasonable and understanding, like oh I you know I understand I paid for this and that this is extra and I'll I'll charge you more for it. Um, but you know I I think I think we deal with it uh, to answer your question a few ways. One is like I said, we try to just cover broad strokes in the proposal. And we've seen thousands of projects at this point. We've seen, we've priced out thousands of projects. Um, so one of the things we do in the back end, we, we like to use artificial intelligence and, and, and kind of machine learning processes to optimize as many of the marketplace and, uh, you know, kind of uh, process functions as we can. So one of them is pricing out a project. And with traditional development shops and agencies, you have this issue where, let's say you run an agency and I come to you and I say, hey, Jason, I'd like to build an Uber for pizza. You're just the sales guy. You're like, okay, that sounds great. But now you have to go back to find an engineer and get in the conference room and whiteboard it out, and he gives you ah. a price. There's the, 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 basically, when those two are coupled, it slows the process to a halt, and it's an awful experience for engineers because great engineers don't want to just quote projects out all day that they don't get to actually build, right? Right, it's annoying. And dealing it's with annoying. the sales executives, no offense to sales execs, they can be pretty annoying too. It's a different culture. It's a different culture, and... You want a GSD, yep. look it up, people, if you don't know. You want a GSD, and the, anybody who's not making the project go faster is making it go slower, right? Yeah. Like if either you're with us or you're against us, and a lot of times the sales process will get in the way of progress. Now, do these developers enjoy quoting, or do only some enjoy building the quote? 
none of our developers ever have to build a quote, which is the great part about Gigster. Okay. Who's building the quote then? I thought that was a developer building that. It's just an artificial intelligence engine. So we've learned over time what the quote what? should be for a project. So a, lo hilarious. a lot of people are just blown away by this. I'll tell you how it works. Okay. So it all starts, this entire system, we call it, you know, you call it, call it the central brain of Gigster or whatever. The entire system runs on on what, what, what we call the project data structure. So Gigster semantically understands um, at a machine level what you're trying to build. So let's say you say you want an Uber for pizza. Well, I, I know that that has payments, that has a login, that has a map view so I can see where the driver is, that has a selector where I can choose a pizza. It has real-time communication so the driver's app can communicate with my app. It has you know all these different features, right? It has a list of features. So when you describe what you want to a sales engineer, they see the chat window on the left, just like you saw in the demo, um, and, then, and on the right they see a calculator where they're actually able to build that data structure and ah. plug in the features you want. So while you're talking, sometimes they string you along and they say, Jason, I love this idea. Where'd it come from? And while you're answering, they're actually finishing your quote. They're hitting the check boxes. Yep, so exactly. Check boxes, dials, sliders. As soon as you finish talking, they're like, boom, here's your quote, Jason. You're like, what just happened? Wow. This quote popped up on my screen. We've had people say, wow, this is unbelievable. How did you do this? Hmm. And people, people, people don't think it's real. Well, the true test is click pay, do the project with us. It's not going to cost any more than we say it will. Right. Now, sometimes do you wind up being underwater on a project because it's misquoted or... You know, the person wants to get more done. And how do you deal with that? Have How many projects have gone through the system? Is it thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds at this point? Uh, Broad strokes? like uh, Hundreds of projects have so far. Through. So we, we've only been around about 11, 12 months. Right. And, you know, of course, these things ramp exponentially. So the first couple of months, we do like a few projects a month. A handful. Yeah. We're at a point now where we're doing, you know, tens of projects a month. And that's wow. getting up into the hundreds of projects a month. Crazy. Um, average project size, you could say, is, uh, you know, between... Ten and thirty thousand dollars, kind of somewhere in that range. So, uh, so we actually, uh, you know, we see we get a ton of data though, because for every project we close, you know, there's a number that we don't close. You mm -hmm. could say there's twenty that we don't close, but we we price all those out, and we do we essentially do a human review process on those projects after the fact. Um, the guy, the guy that uh, has built the artificial intelligence, will, will will do this, and he'll he'll kind of tune the system. We've gotten to the point ah, now where so we're right most of the time. Right. So if we're wrong, sometimes to your point earlier. It's, it's okay, you know, because we lose money on some, we make money on others, it balances out. So when you do the Uber for cupcakes, the Uber for cookies, the Uber for pizza, Uber for puppies, whatever, every time you do it, then the person who's tuning the eye goes back and says, hey, how many, how much did it actually cost us with the developers? Exactly. And what did we miss? Oh, we missed doing the, you know, driver to consumer chat. That actually takes a lot longer than we anticipated. It's not two developer days, it's six. So we keep losing money there. We got to right price it. Exactly, and then and then that that correction gets mapped back to that SKU. So you can think of it like, like a shopping cart. When you check out on Gigster and you click play, pay, you're buying this list. You know, like a receipt you might get from a grocery store. If I want, you know, login and I want checkout and I want, uh, you know, I, I want payments and I want a feed. So all all of those go into your project, and we know for each one how long it takes to build. There's a lot of other intelligence on the back end too that ties to that data structure, but that, that's how the quoting engine works. Now. You're hiring world-class developers, and you're paying them on a project basis. That's right. Not hourly. That's right. There's no incentive for waste. If they can get Facebook login done in 15 minutes, another firm might charge you know, four hours to get Facebook and test it. But if you have somebody who's installed it 100 times, mm -hmm. they know how to install it and test it so fast that they can do it in a tenth the amount of time of a regular developer, and certainly a twentieth the amount of time of a developer probably you know, I don't know who, you know, is a script kitty, let's call it. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, that's, that's, that's one of the keys to the system is that everything from the top down is fixed price. So <clears throat> for the customer, it's great because risk is mitigated. We take on all the risk. We tell you this is going to be 20K. If you say yes, we deliver it for that amount. There's no way that we go over on scope. Um, from the developer's perspective, they, we know we never have to pay them more than whatever amount they agree to, right? So mm -hmm. it's completely fixed on their end. So we have some people, you know, we have college kids that are making $500 an hour. We have a, we have a, sales, we have a sales engineer on the platform right now who's going to make eight hundred dollars to $900,000 this year, right? These people make, people make a lot of money. Uh, and then how do you get paid? 20%? Uh, 30%? What so is it? We, we don't talk about our margin, but uh, most of it, the vast majority, goes to the freelancers. Hmm. We take a small margin, uh, which essentially we, we 
we, we try to feel like we earn. So when we look at our margin stack, let's say, just to throw out a number, let's say that 80% of it uh, is going to the freelancers. Mm -hmm. If we're earning 20%, we ask ourselves, why are we earning 20%? What work did the platform do to earn that 20% margin? You originated the client, you found it? That's part of it, yes. We also, uh, you know, so, so, so Odesk, matches like that. ODES takes 10%. Ah. So matches aren't viewed as very valuable. So let's say a match is worth well, but, 5 to 10%. But you still have to pay to get those customers there and do branding That's to exactly right. originate, right? So It's totally worth, like, let's say 10%. For sure. And then we feel like we earn more because we provide these tools that give efficiencies. We, we not only give the client an individual, we give them a team. So we've put the team together. So if, if you're an individual designer, there's a client you wouldn't have won because they needed development work as well, mm -hmm. right? We provide the developer and a designer so the client does the project with us and you get the, you get the project. So a right. few different pieces. When we get back, I want to figure out who loses in all of this because there are a lot of development shops out there charging 50 to 150 for an app and they've got sales executives and it takes six months, three months, and they're going to take three weeks to get your quote. I want to know when we get back from commercial break what other people think of your platform and the disruptive nature of it, um, and who loses in all of this when we get back on This Week in Startups. Hey, everybody. I want to tell you about DigitalOcean. They are a longtime uh, partner of our program, and we use them for our hosting here at This Week in Startups. It's the best place to get your application off the ground, and it's the easiest place to scale because they use these amazingly fast, awesome servers with SSD drives, you know, solid-state drives, and you can deploy them in under a minute, 55 seconds, in fact. And, uh, of course, DigitalOcean has fantastic user experience that empowers developers and helps you build and scale web applications. You can do customized infrastructure or... You can just choose from a one-click deploy of a popular image, you know, things like Node.js, Magento, Docker. It's a really simple API, and they've got over 550,000 developers deployed on their infrastructure. It's amazing. Uh, it's very straightforward pricing, too. That's why people really love it, especially startups. Plans start at just... $5 a month. So you can get started and play with it right now. Uh, and with hourly pricing, you're only going to pay for the resources you actually use. You get one monthly bill, so it's super easy. Clients include TaskRabbit, Universe.com, Flywheel, Compose, us here at This Week in Startups. And it's really full circle for us here at This Week in Startups because I had Mitch Weiner on um, as a guest caller on This Week in Startups, I don't know, four or five years ago. And then he went on to found DigitalOcean and now hey, um, he has come back and paid us back by uh, sponsoring the program. And I want all the loyal listeners out there who appreciate This Week in Startups to go give DigitalOcean a try. Go to DigitalOcean.com slash twist, DigitalOcean.com slash twist for a $10 credit. Go ahead and get that $10 credit at DigitalOcean.com slash twist. Uh, and they're giving a huge credit to all of our incubator companies. Thanks again for that. And Thanks for DigitalOcean um, just sponsoring independent media like This Week in Startups. We couldn't do it without you. Let's get back to this amazing episode. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. My guest today, Roger Dickey of Gigster. Full disclosure, I put a little bit of money into the company. I'm an angel investor. I invest in 40 companies a year. I try to be a value-added investor, but at the end of the day... Um, the best companies that I invest in don't need my help in a lot of cases. They're just <laughs> off to the races. I think this is going to be one of those Uber or Thumbtack-like experience at Raise.com or Wealthfront where, like, God, the team is just off to the races, and I'm, I'm, I'm a cheerleader. I think this might be – sometimes I'm a coach when it comes to a startup. Other times I'm a cheerleader. I have a feeling I'm going to be in a cheerleader's outfit on this one. <laughs> 200 developers, 50 project managers, 20 designers, 200-plus projects – Developers have earned as much as 13K in one weekend. It's Uber for developers. Gigster is um, just absolutely crushing it. And only 7% of the developers who apply to work in your system get accepted. Actually, less than that now. Now it's less. Uh, but if they do get accepted, they're just wickedly fast, right? You want people who can just whip through the work and do it at a high level. You don't want somebody learning on the job. That's right. Um, and uh, you started... Mafia Wars, and Fishville when at Zynga. You worked for Mark Pincus. Yes. You survived. I did. Uh, He's I He's a good friend it. of mine. I'm joking. I kid. <laughs> <laughs> but did, did yeah. you get the idea while you were there, like outsourcing and stuff like that? or You know, maybe maybe a seed of it. Yeah. Um, so 
the games industry, as you've probably heard, is highly hits-driven, right? So you have to churn out a lot of games for every hit that you find. Yep. Most games are not hits. Maybe 95% of games are not hits, right? Oh. So, so you have a 1 in 20 chance of actually making your money back and about, profit. About 1 in 20, maybe maybe less. Wow. Um, uh, so with, with social games, uh, one idea I pitched Mark on was, hey, how about how about I build a prototyping team within Zynga, mm. and I, I help us try out a lot of different ideas. And I got right. kind of passionate about that idea. Um, I never ended up doing that at Zynga, but it was always in the back of my mind. So uh, that's, that's one thing people use Gigster for is building prototypes very quickly. Ah, very interesting. Okay, now, whenever there's a great startup and it does something revolutionary, there tends to be some losers in the equation. The winners here are obvious. Obviously, the customer's winning because they get a price very quickly and it gets delivered faster. And uh, the developers who are elite developers, part of that 5% or 4% that get accepted because they move fast and they get paid probably triple or quadruple what they would get paid per hour in the Elance, whatever, guru.com, upwork.com, marketplaces. Um, who loses in all of this? Who, who, somebody has to not win, and it, it has to come at some cost. Who would have gotten this work previously, or is this work that just wouldn't have gotten built previously? What's your thoughts on that? Well, And what's the reaction been like from the sort of developer community? That's a great question. Uh, the first, it's funny, the first Hacker News article, uh, or the first Hacker News post that someone did about Gigster, it was overwhelmingly positive because mm. we had this prototype we'd built in two or three days. We looked like this really scrappy uh, engineering culture team. Um, and people were like, rah, rah, go. Like, you, you guys are going to figure this out. Then we raised some money, um, and uh, that article was posted on, on, uh, on Hacker News, and everybody was like, oh, man, this sucks. Why are VCs backing this? Because at, at that point, it looked like some big, you know, evil VC-backed company instead of a cool little developer toy that, we, you know, we, we, we built in two or three days. Mm. So, you know, ha Hacker News culture is kind of difficult to predict and not necessarily representative of all developers, but much in the same way that uh, the advent of 99designs, um, yes. designers were kind of, uh, you know, up in arms about this new concept of crowd, you know, crowdsourced, crowdfunded design, crowd competitions. We've seen some developers uh, balk at the idea Generally, without with, generally without giving much thought to it, you know, if 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 someone's if if the if the way that you work, uh, if someone threatens to change the way that you work, even if for, even even if it's for the better, it can be a little you know overwhelming, a little scary. People don't like change. I mean, there were some yeah. drivers in you know the the ride sharing economy who were like pr former taxi drivers. Oh my God, this new Lyft, this new sidecar, this new Uber, it's different. I, I, I don't have a dispatcher. I need a dispatcher. Then they realized they don't actually need the dispatcher. Then they yeah. realize they don't need to pay the medallion owner. Yeah, then they exactly. realize that getting paid less per hour but keeping more, the net is what matters. Yeah, we've seen people, you know, so so a, f a few developers online have gotten upset about it, but I don't think developers are the loser here. I think I think developers are the winner, especially great developers are, are, are going to end up yeah, making a lot winners. more. Yeah. They're going to have a lot more freedom. They don't have to work for companies unless they want to. And there's always companies that will hire developers because companies still need developers to do to, to work on their core technology. Gigster right now doesn't, uh, we, don't, we don't tell customers we should, we should build their core technology. You look at a company like Twitch TV. Mm -hmm. Twitch TV does high def, you know, high frame, high frame rate video streaming off of like consoles, right? So that they're hiring the best video streaming engineers in the world. We don't have people like that on Gigster. Those, those engineers are highly specialized. They probably should work at Twitch. They were probably born to work at Twitch, Yeah. right? And, and that's beautiful, that's great. But do they need to build Twitch's website? No, Gigster could probably build Twitch's website because build coding HTML is much simpler, much less specialized. For sure. So we're not threatening any sort of specialized engineers, but if someone's doing more, you know, generic work, um, it's the kind of thing that is maybe best done on the Gigster platform, and we'd love to work with them there. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, of course, we, we we threaten agencies that price gouge customers. We've seen people come to us and say, you know, I had this priced, I had an agency price this. They came out at four hundred thousand dollars. Can you beat that? And we're like. Yeah, that's fifty thousand dollars. Drop a zero. Yeah, and they're like, "What are you talking about? This isn't real." And then they, of course, they go pay the agency because they don't think we can do it, <laughs> which is which is sad for all parties involved. Yeah, you should tell them use us to make the prototype, then go to the agency with the prototype. Yeah, and then they'd realize, oh my god, the prototype is as good as that. Now, should startups, uh, you know, if you were me, like an angel investor running an incubator, do you think startups in this day and age, when there's such massive competition, do you think a startup could outsource their entire development and just focus on the business and growth of a product with your system, or is it not designed for that? You know, this is this is going to maybe be a controversial answer, but I believe that most startups should outsource their development. I think- That is pretty controversial. I think, 
you know, and we went through Y Combinator, and it's, and it's funny because YC is famous for not even accepting startups that don't have. You agree with that? You know, over fifty percent engineering founders. You know, I I can't say I do in yeah, light of either. your question. Um, let's say let's say you're a fashion startup. What is it you're really good at? Are you really good at coding in iOS? Or are you really good at understanding fashion trends and reaching your your customer base? For let's sure. say you're a bank. Are you going to be really good at coding some secure PHP backend? No, you probably need to go find customers and come up with good mortgage plans and shit like that. I don't know, whatever banks do. Yeah, right? come up with a novel user proposition and market the hell out of it. Yeah, so that's, if I'm a founder, right, that's what I want to be doing. I want to be talking to customers. I want to be marketing. I want to be building my user base. I don't want to be worrying about finding an engineer and forking over 50% of my company for it, right? I think that's a little ridiculous. You know, I also think in, in, in early days, uh, Gigster, we're, we actually, our company's called Liquid Labs. That's our corporate name. And the idea was we wanted to prototype a lot of different ideas. So we, we burned through over a million dollars of our funding prototyping ideas with a team of six people before we found Gigster, which took three days to build and one guy, which could have been built for free. We didn't need to have a seed round. We could have just done it in my living room, right? So if I had instead just wired 100K to Gigster and said, build me five prototypes, here's a couple different ideas, and had them do it while I went and did something else, I would have gotten five prototypes done in parallel, and I wouldn't have been emotionally tied to any of them because I didn't code them. Mm. One of the biggest problems with technical teams where they're prototyping is they get very emotionally tied to a certain idea. The code base. Yeah, the work. I built this. This is going to be a great product. No, those two things do not go together, unfortunately. It's like building an incredible foundation for a house, and then you realize, like, oh, my God. We're on a fault line. My house should have been over there. It should have been over there. It's a better view, <laughs> yeah. and we're not on a fault line. Yeah. And it's like, well, what do we do with this foundation? It's like, you l just leave it there. You bury it. Startups need to be more flexible early on because 99.9% 90, .9 of the time, you're, it turns out your idea was bad. It doesn't turn out you're dumb because most people doing startups are pretty pretty clever, pretty hungry, pretty hardworking. It turns out you're just kind of doing the wrong thing. Maybe the right market, but the wrong idea. It's typically a failed experiment in the lean startup mode. It's like, we tried this, it did not work. People want something else, but we learned something and we moved on to the next yeah. thing. Yeah, and we, we tried this for you know 18 months instead of trying this for two weeks or one day. What about the ongoing maintenance of apps? Because this, to me, is one of the big problems with the development shops is, oh my God, you know they delivered something, but... We need to maintain it every month. And then there's always like a lot of little pieces at the end that need to be done. Like it needs to be uploaded to iTunes. It needs to be put behind a CDN, needs to be installed. Oh, the domain name needs to be routed. There's like all this like little collateral that a lot of times when people take these development things, they get they get shipped like, you know, a zip drive essentially. Like a, here's your document hmm. folder on Dropbox. Good luck. Do you handle the last mile for all this stuff? Because that seems to me the last mile and the maintenance seems to be both a pain point, which then would also be an opportunity, wouldn't it? Yeah. So we do we do, we do, do all the last mile. We call that handoff. So um, when you're going through a project, you tell us what you'd like done in handoff. App Store submission is actually a fairly labor-intensive process. There's a lot of back and forth with Apple. They tend to reject you. You have to fix bugs. I wouldn't even call them bugs. They're just the you know peculiarities that Apple doesn't like. Uh, depending on the person reviewing it, could you be could, different. Could be totally different. Yeah. So we I'll, had somebody kick back one of Inside's apps because they're like, "You don't have rights to this." I was like, "It's an in-app browser. <laughs> we you you loaded the New York Times in an in-app browser. Yeah. We don't need the rights to the new." And it was just like we just resubmitted it. instead of arguing it, we resubmitted it and said fixed. <laughs> right. And it, yeah. they let it go the next time. It's like, you can't <laughs> even talk to them because it's not a logical argument. They just misunderstood the app. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we've even had people come to us with a fully built app and say, hey, can you submit it to the app store for us? That's <laughs> how annoying Last Mile is. And we do it. Yeah. We'll price the project out. Now, what um, about this maintenance stuff? Yeah, so so that that that's a great question. And, and I think, so So my background is consumer products and product design. You know, I, I, did, I did a lot of that at Zynga. And, uh, you know, my co-founder is kind of the scientific supply side. He fulfills projects, high customer satisfaction, builds amazing AI and tools. I like to think, what should the front end to this be, right? How, how can I make this as close as possible to having a product manager and a development team sitting right next to me? And I can just go up, tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, how's it going? Hey, can you fix this bug? Hey, uh, you know, I want you to add this feature. Can you go ahead and do that? And the product manager says, you know, sure, but that's going to take two weeks and cost $1,000. You say, great, go ahead. And then it gets done. Right, that conversation, if you could imagine expressing that in UI and UX, that's what we'd like Gigster to be. Mm. And, and this is one of the things I think makes Gigster defensible is we're 
we're trying to design this user experience you haven't seen anywhere else with a development shop. So the front end to it is a consumer. It's packaged like a consumer good. We've had people uh, start $40,000 projects after being on our website for only three hours, right? That, that, that never happens. And it's because of that smooth, that smooth experience I showed you earlier, right? It's very easy to chat with somebody, quickly get a quote, click to pay, right? So that experience extends into the project uh, while you're working on it with the team, and then even after the project. Does most of the work happen in a chat room, or can I pick up the phone and call somebody? You can, you can do that. You can chat over email. Uh, we try to track as much of that as we can. Phone calls are the one thing that we can't track, although we have our project managers click to say, I had a phone call with the client. Yeah. But emails, they CC an email tracker, so we have all of that recorded. Yeah, because you need to, if there's scope creep, know that there was scope creep and changes. We're also trying to gather, you know, to... to back to the artificial intelligence point, we're gathering you know, data from everything that happens. Every single part of the project process leaves a digital footprint. So Trello, Trello tasks, GitHub check-ins, Slack chats, emails, phone calls, all of this leaves a footprint. We can, we, can watch it, we can watch the data trail over time, and if a project went off the rails, we can say, oh, well, let's not do whatever we did that time again. How did you get all of these great investors? I saw you have Naval, Greylock, uh, Bloomberg Beta, just a bunch of amazing uh, people have invested. How did you get all these great investors in the company? Um, you know, I think I think a lot. I, I think it was a, f a few things. So first of all, a lot of these folks invested before we had the idea for Gigster. Hmm. Uh, the the names you just read out are, are a lot of our seed investors. Hmm. So uh, you know, I when I was leaving Zynga, um, I recognized that there was a really strong interest for people to want to meet a Zynga executive because Zynga was a very well regarded company at the time. So. I, you know, I took that opportunity. You say to like, like it's not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, you know, stock hasn't performed as well as it could have. Why do you uh, think, Singa, as a total side note, what do you think was the, why do you think it, it came off the rails? Could you know, it have been I, avoided? I think, I think companies need entrepreneurs to weather platform shifts. And uh, when, around the time Zynga was IPOing, a lot of the entrepreneurs had left. A lot of people vested. Um, and then suddenly we realized, oh shit, we have to get on mobile. What are we going to do? And a lot of the people that could effectively get us on the mobile had left because they were the guys that had pioneered the Facebook platform. So mm -hmm. I was one of those guys. I, I left right when we were spinning up mobile initiatives. And I remember, I remember Mark said to me like, hey, can you stay and lead one of the mobile teams? And I said, I would absolutely love to, but I just want to go do my own thing. And I, you know, I would have loved to stay, but I, I, I just had this itch to do my own thing. And, you know, frankly, a lot of, a lot of, uh, entrepreneurial, you know, product guys that are good at making apps should just go do it themselves. The app store is guerrilla warfare. It's different than Facebook. Facebook was winner take all. And Zynga was a company that was designed to be a winner in a winner take all environment. We were highly competitive. We were good at exploiting every every piece of the platform we had to, um, you know, to the gain of users, right? We delivered these fun experiences. Um, but then at the end of the day, when the app store came out, Apple could just set the rankings to whatever they wanted. So it was sort of up to their whim. And when it was when it was no longer, you know, a viral game and became a, you know, a quality game, we weren't poised to immediately capitalize on that. So the company had to shift gears. And without entrepreneurs, that took a while. Yeah, it was a complete paradigm shift. Yep. And it is interesting when you become, come to, to become dominant on Facebook, at the same time, Zynga had to become dependent on Facebook. So dominance yeah. required de dependencies, and now going on mobile, there is a group of companies who dominate, whatever it's King or you know Candy Crush Saga, Supercell. They had to become, to dominate there, they had to become dependent. And they're the next ones who could then be disintermediated by whatever comes next. Yeah, although uh, you know th those guys have built really high-quality products that are mobile first and work very well on mobile. So you know they're fortunate that their interests in Apple's are aligned. Um, at the time, uh, around the time I left Zynga, Zynga's interests in Apple's were not aligned because our games didn't have the high quality polish that other people's had. Right. Apple wants polished stuff you can hold up in a keynote. Yep. Exactly and not right. leverage the latest GPU. And Apple held all the cards with the, with the way they designed the platform. These days, uh, I think every platform that's designed going forward will be designed the way Apple did theirs um, because, you know, a platform rigged... designers want to want to have the power. It's rigged for the platform owner. Completely, yeah. Facebook was rigged for the, the smartest developer. And, but then Facebook realized it, and they said, no more Farmville invites on your feeds, and we're going to create edge rank where we'll figure out what gets shown, and you'll only get to 5% yep. of your page view. So eventually Zuckerberg was like, I'm going to 
take this open platform, I'm using air quotes here if you're listening, <laughs> and he said, you know what, screw it, I'm going to make this a closed platform. Yeah, that's I'm what I'm going to get control of it. Yeah, that was tough for us. The mobile shift was tough. It was a, it was did, a, it was a tough couple of years. Did they, did they feel inside the company double-crossed by Facebook at that point, like that Facebook was, you guys helped build Facebook, got people addicted in there with Farmville and all that stuff, and then Facebook decides, eh, you know what? You got to use our currency. You know what? We're not going to put you on the main feed. Was there a sense that Facebook betrayed Zynga back then? Were people pissed at Facebook? At one point, we were 10 to 20 percent of of uh, Facebook's page views. Yeah. Um, and Facebook uh, Facebook makes ad revenue, so page views is an important metric for them. So we were we were you know we were we were a significant partner for Facebook. I don't think you know. I, I I don't think there was a negative, and I shouldn't speak for the executives. Uh, no, I'm just curious. The culture was. It's yeah, interesting conversation to look back know, on the history now. I don't. I, I I honestly don't think. At least the people that I knew well at Zynga, there wasn't a negative sentiment. It was more of like a you know, ah, oh, too bad the party's over kind of thing. Right. <laughs> That's pretty I felt much that what way it was. with SEO. Although I felt I felt I took it very personal when Google changed the rules of SEO without telling us. <laughs> that to me, I felt was very low. It's like one thing to screw over your partners who helped you build something. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to like just hit them in the head with a bat and they don't expect it. You know, it's like, just give us a little heads up that thing, the world's going to change. So we're not like racing towards a cliff, right? Like all these companies were racing towards a cliff, making so much content, getting it ranked. We figured out, hey, if we build a really, if we spend $500 on a page on how to make salmon, we can make it back in, you know, whatever, 20 months. Okay, go ahead, spend the five hundred dollars. And then I was like, Oh no, it's gonna take five years. <laughs> it's gonna take fifteen years. It yeah. was like a very interesting platform shift. Um, so how do you know you'll have succeeded with Kickster? You know, is, are there things that you're looking at and you'll say, you know what, if this happens, we're going in the right direction? Or what are the things that you look at and say, Hey, if this continues to happen, this is going to become a billion dollar business? Because let's face it, you don't Mark and Dreesen doesn't put $10 million or whatever he put in the round, $10 million round, congratulations. They're, they're, they're only interested in multi-billion dollar companies, so they, that's a big tell if Andreessen in Horowitz is investing. So how does this become a billion dollar business, and what, what are the key things you look at to say, hey, I'm on the way to that extraordinary goal? Well, well, first of all, I mean, to level set, if we, if, if we don't mess up, this will be the largest company founded this decade. This is a very, very large vision. I mean, we're, we're talking about we're talking about software development outsourcing and ultimately other types of knowledge work. So design, you could imagine push a button, get lawyers, push a button, get a, you know, get a team of lawyers, push a button, get a team mm. of management consultants, right? So what we're trying to do is transform not only how people hire and engage with knowledge worker talent, um, but also how, how, how knowledge workers find flexible employment options, starting with software development, because that's what we know. Mm. So the vision is huge. I mean, he, he, huge doesn't begin to describe it. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I think, I think how we know we've succeeded is when people see Gigster as this alternative to outsourcing, this alternative to work, where it becomes kind of a different verb in the same way that Uber has. So you, you don't look at Uber as a kind of taxi with a different name. There's Ubers and then there's taxis. It's a different concept. When you say, I'm going to take an Uber, people understand all the trappings that come with that. They understand, you know, I can just tap a button and I get it immediately. Um, I know I can trust the driver. I can see it on my phone. If I, I leave my wallet, pay. I know who the driver is and I will get it back. I can go back and get it. Yeah, it's not going to be somebody sketchy. <laughs> happened to me recently. You know, I, I don't have to call into a call center and have somebody, you know, wait 15 minutes and they're kind of rude and they pick up the phone. Yeah. You know, I used to hate calling into cab call centers, right? So you get yelled at by the dispatcher and then you have to hear yeah. the dispatcher yell at the driver. Yeah. And then, and then you, the you line. hear them on like CB radio, literally. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, uh, where the fuck are you? We have a guy at Van Ness and whatever. Like, yeah. He's just pulling up. He's pulling up. I'm 15 minutes. I'm on the BQH. Oh, yeah, he's pulling up. It's like, yeah. I can hear in the background the lie. It's just a totally different experience, yeah. right? So, we, we, you know, when I start hearing people say, you know, oh, should I, should I outsource or should I use Gigster? Then I think we'll know we've, I think we'll know we've done something special. And software is eating the world. So it plays right into Andreessen Horowitz's wheelhouse. How many VCs? Did you meet with to do this A round, broad strokes? Why'd you pick Andreessen Horowitz? So Andreessen Horowitz was our first choice. Um, Why? Well, you know, as you said, Mark Andreessen did coin the term "software is eating the world," and those guys just have they have this great they have this great engineering culture. Um, and we, for for whatever reason, we got along with everyone there on a personal level very well. And that firm, 
understands customer service unlike anyone else. Mm. I swear, when we walked in, everybody knew our names. Like people we hadn't even met was like well, almost to a creepy level. Like they sent out our pictures and they're like, hey, these are the guys we're meeting with. Did you they know, give you you, hugs? You see them say something nice. They didn't give you hugs, did they? Uh, like those creepy- Our uh, partner Lars summit, did. At Summit at Sea, people give you hugs. Or the <laughs> Summit people. That's what I heard. They give you like this like long, Seven hug. second hug or whatever. It's like a seven second hug. And then they <laughs> ask you to buy a lot on the mountain- <laughs> That has no snow or something. <laughs> it's an MLM yeah. scam or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I won't comment on that. But, uh, <laughs> but seven seconds. Yeah. <laughs> but no, like those guys are those guys are super, you know, super nice on the ball. Incredible customer service. They, they really, they really got it. You know, we had we had third tier VC firms like that we'd never even heard of pass or try to lowball us. And Andreessen immediately was like, "Wow, this is going to work, right?" So I, I think the thing you see with with some investors is. If you get turned down by an investor, often the reason is that person just really wasn't the right fit for you. Because an investor, an, an investor is a partnership. If somebody meets you and they're like, "Holy shit, I get what you're doing. I want to get involved." I think as a founder, it behooves you to try to get that person involved. And that was our experience with Andreessen from the start. Mark made it a personal priority to talk to us, even though we didn't necessarily come in with the warmest of intros. Um, he was in. That's a big deal because I have to say, Mark is a bit of a recluse. Like he doesn't meet with a lot of people. Yeah. Well, so Mark kind of known for that. I, I th I, what he said to us, and I think he said this, was that he had a personal thesis for this idea, and for the last twenty or thirty years, he'd been looking for someone who was going to do this the right way, as he said it. Got and, it. And when he met us, he was like, you know what? I think this is the one. And I think he said something like that to his partners. Like we we started describing it, and he just looked over and started nodding to Ben Horowitz or you know whoever was in the room on demand. On-demand yeah. software is eating the world. It makes it totally in his wheelhouse. Yeah, no, and, and it was how we did it too. Because yeah. people for for years have been saying, "Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a super optimized agency." Like, who wouldn't want to do that, right? It's a pretty obvious idea. But the way that we actually do it is the right way to do it, and the unique combination of technologies that exist right now makes now the right time to do it. So I think Mark saw that and was just like, "You know what? This is a pretty obvious bet for us to make." It's um. The, I have to say, the UI experience when you walk through it makes you smack your head and go, well, duh. Of course, you should just dump somebody into a chat room, let them fill it out, give them a price based on what they said, and just start the discussion with the most uncomfortable piece of the whole puzzle, which is, what is this going to cost me? Yeah. And what are you going to do with that? It's really like, if you somebody could make an amazing car company based just on the fact that you tell people the price of the car. And in fact, Tesla does that, yeah. where there's no negotiation. So you're just like, you fall in love with the car. And Saturn had that same, they had a car called Saturn for a while. And the whole point of it was that all the dealerships just charged the same price. There was no haggling and whatever. But this idea that whatever the most painful part of the experience is, you build the experience around resolving that. Like getting the taxi to pick you up was the hardest thing for, you know, in the Uber thing. And it's here, right? Like you, you took the most painful part, which was the quote, and you front loaded it. Yeah, we ask we ask customers right up front. We actually have two quotes we give them. We first give them a range so we can qualify them immediately. So we, you know, so they say, "Oh, I kind of want this." We we ask a few questions, but then pretty much immediately we say, "Okay, this will cost about twenty to thirty-five. Is that in your range?" And some people are like, "Oh God, no! I I want to pay ten. What can I get for ten? And then the conversation takes a different turn. We don't say, "Go away." We say, "Okay, no problem. Are you okay removing these three features?" Right. We'd love to work with you. Right. It's important to qualify the customer, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's for for both of us. We don't want to waste their time and have them chat with us for three hours and then suddenly they get hit with a huge price. Right. Right. And they could. It seems like there's three prices in the world. There's getting overcharged. There's getting a good deal, you know, a, a, a realistic deal. And then there is like this, you know, fakaka. You know, people will charge you anything to get the deal and then hit you up with higher prices later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you fit, charge you for maintenance or whatever. Whatever it is, yeah. Like I, I mean, people were given quotes of like six thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars to build an app. And then you're like, yeah, but oh, that didn't include design. Oh, it didn't include this. It didn't include that. It, you know, and all of a sudden they get back up to the 20k that you guys are charging or whatever. We find that that's an awful experience for customers, and it just leads to consternation and complaints later. And then we, yeah, you know, people people go people go complain on Twitter, and they tell all their friends never to use Gigster. You know, you, you just can't. You don't want that, right? As a startup, your priorities should be growth and customer satisfaction, not margins, not squeezing squeezing as much as you can out of people. Uh, you know, honestly, that's one of the th bigger things that differentiates us from agencies and development shops is they're just different businesses. They're lifestyle businesses. 
right? So every year, they're not trying to grow exponentially like a startup. They just want to make, you know, a million dollars that year. So per partner. You know, so they, they have to go get, you know, as much as they can out of each project and just milk it. So it's more of a game of how much can I get out of this person, right? Then can I give this person a great deal so they go tell all their friends? That's our priority. You're trying to build a scalable platform. They're trying to pay for their Hamptons rental. Yeah, it's yeah. A slightly it's different, different approach. And, you know, like, I always tell people how bad the service business is because when I was in the service business, I remember in IT in the 80s and 90s, I had the certain uh, realization when I was installing Novell Networks. Oh, Land Systems is making, the way this company makes money is how much they can charge a company to for me to install it and how little they can pay me. Now I know when I ask for a raise why there's resistance. If my salary goes up, their margin goes down and they're already overcharging these clients. I know that because I'm making $50,000 a year and they're billing me out at 250. And I'm working 60 hours a week. These guys are printing money. You have the opposite, which is you're just taking your whatever, 10, 20%, whatever you guys wind up skimming and earning they can the, the developers can make as much as they want. Yeah, we've we've actually had sales guys try to cherry pick customers they think have deep pockets and put 50 100% margins on and they get in trouble afterwards. Mm. They're always like, "Look, Roger, like we made a lot of money on this." I'm like, "Don't do that. <laughs> That's not how we're building this business." Yeah, if you who's going to come back if they felt like they got ripped off? Yeah, cuz they'll find out they'll find out somehow later. And it's just it's not the way we have to do things. We don't have to make 100% margin or, you know, 50% margin on each project. There's no need. I think this is going to be a billion dollar business, I'll say it right now. I mean, I don't know what this round was done at. I mean, actually I do, but I actually <laughs> don't even remember off the top of my head right now, but I know you did well, but I You'll think You'll do well too. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's very interesting angel investing. Uh, especially angel investing after Listen, you're, I got lucky to hit the uni- mother of all unicorns and then three other unicorns. It's a very interesting thing. At a certain point when you're an angel investor, you, you do what Saka did or Andreessen did, which is you move upstream or you just enjoy your life. Um, or you just do it because you love the founder and the idea and you want to see the company exist in the world. This is like, for me, I just want to see this idea work, I'll be honest. I think this is like one of those things that be, if it did work, I would use it. And I would like to see it out there because I'm working on inside or like I want to redo the launch ticker and rewrite it from the bottom up. And I would just really like to have a place that I could just say, here's the spec. Can we rebuild the launch ticker 2.0 or it would be 3.0 now because the last one was built off of, I don't know, .NET or something. And I would just – how do you deal with the languages? Do you pick the language? We try to. Yeah. Because if we can pick the language, then we can use more common code and make it cheaper. Yeah. If the customer says, oh, I want you to use Erlang or something obscure, then we've got to charge a little more because you have to go find that engineer. What about who owns the code? How does that work? Because you uh, reuse a lot of code, I'm certain. We do. So great question. Uh, by default, we uh, we own the code and mm. we grant the customer, uh, you know, irrevocable permanent license to the code. Got Essentially it. a license that's legally indistinguishable indistinguishable from ownership. Got it. That's that's the idea. Now some customers, uh, our enterprise customers, sometimes come back and say, hey, we need to actually own the code outright. This needs to be work for hire. It needs to be fully assigned to us. Yeah. And we'll say, no problem. We'll charge you an extra, you know, five thousand dollars for that. And the enterprise customers say, great, sounds good. Where do I sign? The startups say, you know what, I'll just let you own the code. Mm. So the startups end up uh, helping us build this large repository of code, which we can, you know, we'd never use their their any personal code, any copyrighted thing like their landing page or anything like that. But yeah. if we had to build some like module on the back end to do scheduling, we might reuse it in another project, you know, because it's not any private IP of that company. Um, but, you know, this, the startups help us build this repository, which you can use to make everybody's project cheaper. I mean, my goal is you come to Gigster, you say, hey, you know, I'd love a page that does X, Y, Z. And suddenly a download link pops up and they're like, great, that'll be $50. <laughs> Natural yeah. language, English straight to code. Our goal is to be the shortest path from an idea to a finished product. And I love this. I ask myself every day, how do I remove steps from that process, which is now about three or four months. Now I'd I like it like, to be three or four I want to take some of these ideas I had, like the truth about cars, which I couldn't get anybody to take on that startup idea. A truth about um, homes. Truth about mm. cars is a great blog. The truth about homes, I had this idea to let people go into homes, take a bunch of pictures, and just say what they think mm-hmm. uh, about the home, and then what it will sell for, or what they think it's worth. Because you have all these like homes, and you, every website is designed to tell you not the truth. But if somebody walked through with a camera, took pictures and said, hey, this, this stove is old, or this is 
shoddy work or this is incredible and you just take 20 pictures and then boom, how much would that cost to make? You take 20 pictures, whatever number of pictures, you upload them from your camera, you put notes on them and then it publishes it to a web page and in the app. Cool. So like wisdom of the crowds for home prices and maybe maybe if you guess the price right, you win. Yeah, That's there could be motivator. a little bit of that. Like you could get 10 people to run through the house and you know whoever came closest, like price is right, device. They get like 100 bucks. The or they just get, get a star. Bucks. You know, whoever, they get to be first place from that one. But okay. the idea being, my idea originally was I want to pay somebody to go visit the home for me and pay them a hundred bucks. And so if, like, cause I'm going to buy a home this year probably, or next year uh, in San Francisco, I would just like to pay somebody a hundred bucks to go to five homes a week for five weeks. And it would cost me $2,500 to get these reports back. But at least they would tell me what the house is actually worth and the pictures. Cause the brokers I don't trust. Yep. They just want to close a transaction. On both sides. On both sides. I hate them. I'm infuriated. I mean, I think like the worst people on the planet. It's sort of like ISIS. <laughs> and <Then. laughs> it's ISIS, I think. Um, and then it goes down to like Trump. <laughs> Agreed real there. estate brokers. And, and then it's the people who um, walk on the left side of the escalator. <laughs> you know, like the passing lane on the escalator on the people mover, like the people <laughs> yeah, who do that. Yeah. And then right below them are the people who are, who are tourists who walk five abreast on market. <laughs> okay. You know, if you're like, I kind of put them actually above ISIS <laughs> because I'm I trying just to walk get in, somewhere. I just walk in the street, man, if I have to. No, that's what I do. But in New York yeah. City and in San Francisco, you have these people who are, on, they're, they're here as tourists and they have to like, some of them hold hands. It's like, <laughs> you're really walking down Fifth Avenue holding hands? You're creating a roadblock, single file, <laughs> perhaps two abreast. But that's as far as I'm going. Two abreast is my limit. Fully agreed. I'm a fast walker as well. What are these people doing? <laughs> we're, like, same is, mind. we're here in a city trying to get shit done. GSD. Exactly. Single file. <laughs> Maybe two abreast. Anyway, what is that going to cost me? What do you think? You know, I, I, I think... It it, it's, it's a good idea, isn't it? it, it it's, it's, a, it's a good idea for sure. You know, I, I, I think... I'm going to put you in the incubator. I'm going to put Gigster and you in the incubator okay. to just build this. Great. It'll it, be our seventh incubator company. Had a company drop out. You'll be the seventh incubator company. Okay. And then... You just graduate and you show it. That'd be fun, actually. That, that'd be fun, it's actually. It's a pretty good idea. Yeah. Um, I, I think we could do it, you know, for like... 20K. So that's that's the number I was thinking, yeah. was something around 20K. You know, I, I'd have to I dive into the pizza. exact feature with you, yeah. with, with you, but, you know, I, I think it would be 20K at the, at the base if it was super simple, this really quick. This is a good idea. Up to 35 if you wanted to put a bunch of bells and whistles in. Okay. So we'll do it. And then I have to find a CEO for it because I can't be CEO. <laughs> That's true. But I can't Unless it takes it. off. You never know. No. I don't <laughs> want to be – I don't ever want to be CEO of anything again. No? I'm done. I just want to angel invest. <laughs> CEO is the worst job ever. You, you'll, you'll see. It me. is. It's, it's a tough job. You can't sleep at night. you got to stare at the ceiling. Oh, yeah. my God. Payroll. I slept one hour last night. Of course. You sleep two tonight. All right. Listen, enough. We can talk for hours. <laughs> I'm super excited to be an investor in Gigster, and congratulations to Roger Dickey on raising $10 million. Thank you. Beautiful. Congratulations to Mark Andreessen. Going to make even more money that he doesn't need, <laughs> but that's okay because he likes to give his money away. His wife gives all his money away. Great. <laughs> I love that. They buy beautiful art too, which is also nice. I know. You go to, I've been to Andreessen Horowitz. It's like <laughs> yeah. being in a like a... Uh, it's a museum. It's basically like going to LACMA or something like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. You're like, really? <laughs> and there's so much art now that like, there's so much art in Andreessen Horowitz that it's being placed like in, be they, they had a certain number of pieces of art that were supposed to go up and now they're in between and like a little <laughs> Picasso here, you go to the urinal, there's like a little Matisse, you it's know, like on a each urinal. In your way. Yeah, you just like you there's art like it. everywhere. Like the placemats <laughs> in the cafeteria are like, you know. <laughs> it's a fun place. <laughs> it's a fun place. <laughs> All right, listen, we can talk forever. Hey, if you want to follow up Roger, he's Roger Dickey on um, Twitter and uh, try Gigster and Gigster.com. And thank you to all of our partners. We don't call them sponsors here, they're partners. We partner with people. Uh, and thanks, Ashley, Jay, Jackie, Luke, Matt, everybody who's helping out, Bryce, Chief of Staff. You can follow the show at TWI Startups. You can follow me at Jason on Twitter. And now I'm at Jason on Instagram. Nice. And I'm Jason.tumblr.com, but I don't think anybody's using Tumblr anymore. I'm trying to get, I would like to have YouTube.com slash Jason. 
All right, let's we'll also have Jason at gmail.com. Who owns Jason at gmail.com? I tried to get Roger at Gmail. Uh, apparently, the limit's six characters, so it doesn't exist. What? That's what I found out. Could be wrong. Melon Farmer. So there is no Jason. Melon Farmer. <laughs> you can look that up, folks. Melon Farmer. All right, we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. I'm super excited about our next speaker. Sue, come on out. Sue Kim, here she is. And this is really like um, a full circle type thing because Sue was with a company called All Tuition. And All Tuition, four years ago, was it now? Three and a half? Three, three. three years. Three years ago, won the launch festival. You were a new company. Mm -hmm. And you had this idea of helping people uh, save money on their tuition and figure out what college was right for them. And you met somebody at the conference. Who did you meet? Chamath. You met the infamous Chamath. And he worked with you on this, pivoting the company to a new idea called Brilliant. And in that time, Brilliant has grown. And full disclosure, I always invest in the winner. So I invested <laughs> in the winner of the conference. You've grown to a million people using the product every month uh, and had amazing success. And today, you're going to talk to us about how you got to the first million. Yeah. And have you disclosed the financing of the companies? Uh, the latest round? <laughs> Not yet. OK. So we won't disclose the latest round of financing yet. I'm going to get so many emails after so this. So in trouble. Anyway, she's ra but you raised money previously. So you've raised a decent amount of money for the company. Yeah, this is our Series B. The, oh, so this would be Series B coming yeah. up. OK. Uh, uh, all right. Just finished. Just finished the Series B. Um, I won't say any of the details, but wow. Um, <laughs> please welcome Sue Kim. All right, so I'm Sue Kim from Brilliant, and this presentation is about our first million users, how focusing on triggers rather than users got Brilliant in the Two Comma Club. Uh, Jason came up with that title, not me. All right, so I'm the co-founder and CEO. Brilliant is a community-generated resource in math and science, and over the last two and a half years, we've grown our community to a million monthly users. Jason asked me to share with you how we thought about our product decisions along the way. So the big question that nagged at me as we were starting is when we would get to product market fit. The problem was that product market fit was this abstract and binary thing. I didn't have a real definition for it, but I figured I'd know it when I saw it. Product market fit for a while was this thing that would happen in the future, and my team didn't have a good sense of whether we were making progress towards it. What we needed was a concrete definition. And once you start defining product market fit, a few things become obvious. The first is that product market fit looks different for different companies. And the second is that product market fit is not the same thing as early hypergrowth. We have this bias where the only companies that you and I know about are the ones that made it, basically the ones with the best products now in their categories. And their product market fit seems obvious. It's easy to assume that it was also obvious to the companies very early on because of their immediate and explosive hypergrowth. But the reality is that some of these companies did have early hypergrowth, others did not, and still others changed their product completely before they succeeded. So product market fit looks different for different companies. And today, I'd like to share with you our process for understanding whether we have product market fit and are making the right decisions to improve it. So step one, there are only two steps. Step one is identify the trigger for your product. What is the moment in time when a user needs your product? This is the trigger. And then when and how frequently does this trigger occur? Product market fit is how often people choose your product when they have that trigger. So when Brilliant first started, we got this really wrong. Here's what we did. We started by imagining our user when we talked about our product, in particular, our early adopters. We also surveyed them, and we talked to them extensively. And we built this really detailed user profile of a person who's into math, science, and engineering. They attend high school or college. They excel in their classes. They like to be challenged. They want peers who share their interests. And this was a pretty good description of our first 10,000 users, but it was not a great start for building a product. Building a product around a narrative of a user is hard because it's still very abstract. 
People on your team will have a different vision of what that user looks like and how the product can appeal to them. And then you start getting sidetracked by conversations about features like, well, as someone who grew up in Boise, Idaho, I would really want a feature to help me directly message my peers in this community who love probability and game theory as much as I do. So here's the trick to sidestepping all of those conversations, is be specific about the trigger for using your product. What this does is make the use case specific so that you're building your experience not around an abstract user, but around solving a specific need at the point in time when it occurs. So here's an example of a trigger and use case. When someone is trying to understand a concept, they want lots of examples that convey the key ideas efficiently and problems to test understanding and recall. The reason that this is powerful is because you could be a kid in Boise who's interested in probability and game theory, or a chemistry PhD in Singapore who wants to understand artificial photosynthesis. The people look completely different, but the trigger has identical characteristics. The person wants to understand a concept, and the job of the product is to satisfy that use case. So triggers can help make product market fit concrete before you achieve hypergrowth. Because you can incrementally measure your progress by how often people choose your product when that trigger occurs. So step two, start from your triggers when making product decisions. So here's what decision making looks like when you don't start from your triggers. Uh, we did this a lot early on, and I hope to spare you the pain. Uh, it's listing pros and cons for features and then using that as a framework to make decisions. So here's an example of that. Uh, the feature of allowing users to message each other. Uh, there's a plausible list of pros. There's a plausible list of cons. They're perfectly reasonable and valid. But the problem with making decisions by looking at something like this is that both of these columns are totally irrelevant to the main factor that should be driving the decision, which is product strategy. Your product strategy and the growth and retention efforts surrounding it should start from your product trigger. How do you satisfy users when they have that trigger? This helps you stay focused on what you want to achieve instead of the tactics that supposedly work and saves you from making a pros and cons list for each feature that might be a good idea. Every decision you make should move your product further up the product market fit spectrum so that more people choose your product more often when they have the trigger. So to summarize the two steps, step one, identify the trigger for your product. Step two, start from your triggers when making product decisions. Product market fit is how often people choose your product when that trigger occurs. In closing, uh, here's what we've gained from focusing on triggers. Uh, number one, reduced inputs simplify product decisions. We've already talked about this. Uh, instead of studying what people want, triggers reduce the inputs to a concrete when and a concrete why. Number two is that you get a clear and falsifiable hypothesis. It's easier to prove that your trigger doesn't exist for a mass market than that people don't want what your product does. What you definitely don't want to do is get stuck in conversations like this. Maybe people just don't want what our product does, and that's why nobody used it today. This is unproductive because it leads to an abstract discussion about what users want in their lives. And the reality is there are probably a lot of reasons that people aren't using your product. Chances are your product four months in is buggy and terrible. Uh, chances are you're not good at marketing it yet. This should not throw your team into an existential crisis. Instead, you can stay focused on concrete and answerable questions. Uh, like, number one, does your trigger actually occur in people's lives, and how often? Number two, what are they doing now in response to it? This could be nothing. This could be using a competitor's product. This could be asking their mom. Number three, why will your product satisfy the user more than the alternatives? That's my presentation. You can access it at brilliant.org slash scale. Thanks for listening, and I'm happy to take a few questions. OK, so uh, if you're in the Herps chat room and you have a question, uh, let's hear it. And I would say, oh, I have a question right off the bat while the questions are coming in here and I'm reading them. Um, how did you uh, navigate raising money uh, during the pivot and pre-growth for the company? Um, because I know that that was obviously a challenge. Uh, that was a challenge. It's very challenging to, uh, first of all, have an intense meeting with Chamath, 
where uh, the conversation went something like, Sue, I think you have a very talented team. I think you're wasting the best years of their lives working on a product that is not going to grow that much. And uh, I think that if that happens, you will be the person responsible for that, and how will you live with yourself? Uh, and <laughs> so he was very subtle about it, charming. <laughs> this was our first meeting. Um, and then he said, you know, fundamentally, I think what's worse is that you guys are going to work on this for 10 years. It's going to have a high chance of failure. Um, you know, every project that you, any project that you chose to work on is going to be hard. And at the end of that, do you really want to work on a thing that's not actually fixing the fundamental problem? He said, you know, all tuition is creating this kind of like layer. Uh, of convenience and cost savings for consumers. And that's like sort of valuable, and I'm sure people will pay for it. But you're not fixing student loans. You're not fixing the cost of college. So I mean, wouldn't you admit that like maybe this is a waste of your time? Uh, and let me offer you the following. All of these like great VCs have offered you uh, a Series A round. Um, I will also offer you a Series A round at the same terms. But consider me your head of biz dev. And uh, you can use my influence and my deep pockets to achieve anything you want in the world. You can build anything you want. Uh, is this what you would be building, or would you be building something else? And, uh, and then like, the famous part of the story is that my co-founder, after that meeting, went to the bathroom and threw up. And then I experienced also quite a bit of vertigo. And you know, we had to talk about it uh, pretty thoroughly about abandoning this thing that we had worked on for a year and a half. And, uh, and then go back to our team and talk about this crazy meeting that we had uh, on the West Coast where you know, our team was in Chicago. And, uh, and then we also had to consensus build with our uh, investors who had seed invested in Altuition. And you know, I guess it just comes down to like we had a really, uh, when we decided that we were going to work on a different company um, and we were going to raise money for this other company, we did not feel apologetic about it because at the point when we made that decision, we knew that it was the right thing to do. Um, and of course, there's all of these tactics for fundraising and communicating and making your pitch deck and all of that. But I think that what comes across most is just your level of personal conviction um, and your passion for solving a real problem. So yeah. What's the, this is from Patrick. What's the best way to research or better understand triggers? Uh, let's see. There's a book uh, by Ryan Sarver called Hooked that I really enjoyed. And I think that that's like a good start. I really enjoyed that read. Um, there is an article on Medium about uh, something about like you should look, you should think about the job that your product does um, and state like the job of your product. Um, those are the two things that I can come, on, come remember off the top of my head that I remember reading and thinking, wow, this is really good. How many, this is from Adam Plumer from the Slack chat room, how many triggers do you evaluate at a time? How many triggers do you evaluate at a time? Um, you know, I think if you're a startup, like doing more than one is crazy. Uh, because, you know, a trigger is not like you have a bunch of them in your product. It's an integrated thing where all of your marketing and messaging is going to be around that trigger. Um, you know, the way that you think about like which channels you're going to use is very dependent on that trigger. Um, your product features and you know your whole product is centered around building this engagement loop that then people use hundreds of times, hundreds of thousands of times, or millions of times a day. You know, if you're a consumer product and you're working on something that is like a Silicon Valley size ambition, um, there has to be something that people are doing in your product a lot of times every day. Uh, and so I think like to try to do more than one thing is like probably not a good idea. Question from Mothra J. Um, how did you get your first 1,000 users and validate product market fit? Uh, so I mean, the first 1,000 users only validate product market fit for like 1,000 users, right? So that's not. Uh, I think that like we moved up the spectrum like a teeny tiny amount. Um, our first 1,000 users, like we got them the way that I think lots of companies get them, which is we emailed everybody that we knew and we posted it on Facebook, um, and that. I think ended up being a thousand people. And uh, last question, Billy Boozer asks, um, who vets the triggers in the organization? Product managers, you, the CEO, who? Um, I think that this is probably different at different companies. At Brilliant, it is me who makes the final call. Um, but that said, I have uh, 
two colleagues that I work very closely with on product, um, and who you know we are, we have a, a culture of like sort of vicious debate. Like we make it like our sort of mantra about this is that an, ad an idea isn't good until you can defend it. So you can have an idea and it's bad because you can't defend it. And then you can have an idea and it's the same idea, but it's good because you can defend it. And you know, in building this product, like as we got to this framework of like, wow, building, like trying to like imagine users is really complicated. Like what else is there that we can try that's a little bit simpler and that has fewer inputs? Um, and you know, we probably spent like on the order of a couple months, like really, really honing our definition of what the trigger is um, and how we would build our product around it. Uh, and you know, it's just a, a probably going to be a like a period of debate with your uh, with the people who challenge you most at your company. Awesome. And so let's hear it for Sue Kim. Well done. <laughs> <laughs>